Good morning. Good morning. Everybody awake? Oh yeah. yeah. Evidently you've learned how to talk in your sleep. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I know we're a little bit tired, but uh, I'm excited about what I, God has for us this morning. We're continuing to talk about grace, and today we're going to talk about an aspect of how grace enables us to live in this life. And I want to start off with the questions I usually do. How many of you have experienced hurt in life? Now, I'm not just talking about physical pain, but, but you've been hurt by somebody, all right? All right, in this life, you're going to experience hurt. In fact, it's been said that if hurts were hairs, we'd all be bears. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. If hurts were hairs, we'd all be bears. What's that mean? It means we experience hurt in life so often that if we got a hair on our body for every single hurt that we've experienced, it wouldn't take long before what? we'd all be looking pretty woolly, right? We'd all be looking pretty hairy. We've all experienced hurt, injustice. Maybe it was being made fun of or getting picked on. That's not fun. And it can seem innocent at times, but it really hurts sometimes. I know that pain. Maybe it was always getting picked last for the sports team. Anybody always get picked last? All right. I always got picked last, so I'm with you. Maybe you got ignored by somebody that you hoped would notice. Maybe it was something a lot worse. Maybe you were abandoned by somebody that should have never abandoned you, rejected or betrayed. Maybe you were abused. I don't know what the hurts that you've experienced are, but I know something about them. I know they're real and I know they're painful. And the question that I want us to wrestle with this morning is what do we do with our hurts? Because if hurts were hairs, we'd all be bears. So what do we do with our hurt? We have to do something because our hurt becomes lodged in our lives and our hearts and we have to do something with this hurt. And I want us to even go beyond what do we do with the hurt. What do we do with the people that have hurt us? What do we do with the people who have betrayed us, who have abused us, who have wronged us, who have caused pain in our life? Well, one of the things that we could do with the hairs is that we could shave them down, right? And I think a lot of times that's what we do with our hurt and that's what we do with our pain. We sort of shave it down. But there's something you need to do. Everyone who's shaved knows something about the hair. It's not gone, is it? It grows back. One of the ways that we shave down our hurts is by getting back or getting even. How many of you have ever gotten back? <laughs> All right. Sometimes we, we, we feel like the best thing to do is to pay them back. And, and you know, that really is the natural response to being hurt. The natural response to being hurt is to want to hurt back. And sometimes we don't want to just settle the score. We want to settle it and then a little bit more, right? You know, with interest. And then sometimes we think, no, I know I really shouldn't do that. So instead of, instead of paying somebody back, we just sort of plot it in our minds. How many of you have ever plotted some amazing revenge? Right? Wow, you're worse than I thought. <laughs> just kidding. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there where we plot. Here's what, this is what I would, if they better be glad that I'm a Christian. Because if I wasn't, right? And what happens when we respond that way is that it shaves down the hairs, but it doesn't really deal with the hurt and the pain. And God wants to deal with our heart, and he wants to deal with that hurt. And Jesus has a different way. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Jesus says, You have heard that the law of Moses says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Love your enemy enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, there's some things that Jesus said that just sort of sometimes make us step back and say, did he really just say that? Does, does he know what he's talking about? He says, love your enemies and pray for the people that persecute you? Jesus, do you really understand what you're saying? Do you know what I've been through? Do you know how I feel? And I want you to see this morning that God does know how you feel. Jesus does understand what it's like to be hurt and what it's like to be betrayed and stabbed in the back and walked out on. 
The night before Jesus dies, something very extraordinary happens. If you have your Bible this morning, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 13. And we're going to look at, at an amazing scene that happens the night before Jesus dies. I'm sure that many of you are going to be familiar with this scene. Many of you are going to be familiar with this story. But I want us to look at it because something very weird, very shocking and unprecedented happens the night before Jesus dies. And it's going to show us, among other things, how we can handle the hurt and the hurters of life. John chapter 3, and let's look at the first five verses to begin. I'm John chapter 13. Caught that mistake. Sometimes I catch my mistakes, sometimes I don't. But I know that you catch all of them, so... John chapter 13, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He now showed the disciples the full extent of his love. It was time for the supper, and the devil had already enticed Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to carry out his plan to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and then began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that he had around him. Now, I know most of us have read these words before. We've heard these words. We've heard sermons on these words. But I believe that, that few of us have ever really paused long enough to let the impact and the weight of what we just read sink into our hearts and to our lives. Think about this scene. The upper room. It's been prepared for the Passover meal. Jesus had made sure that others went ahead and prepared this room so that he could have the Passover meal with his disciples. It was the most important Passover meal that ever occurred because it was there at this Passover meal that Jesus is going to even more fully and clearly reveal to his followers what is about to happen. And not only that, but he's going to show them that this Passover that the Jewish people have celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years as they remembered what God had done in Egypt was not just a memorial that looked back to the past, of God's deliverance, but it was also a memorial that looked forward to God's deliverance. As Jesus explains that he is the fulfillment of the Passover, that he is the one who will die in place of the people. He is the one whose blood will cover and protect from death. And as he's preparing to share that message with his disciples and this meal with his disciples, they all come into the room but there was something missing. There was no servant there to wash feet. You see, in this day and age, people traveled by foot and they wore sandals and they walked on dusty roads. And so their feet got really what? Dirty, gross, nasty. Right? And you have to understand, they didn't eat around tables the way we do. They ate around very low tables and they sort of reclined like this around the table. And they would eat. Now, I think some of you are starting to get where I'm going with this, right? When you eat like this, what's right next to your face? The next person's feet. Good time to be on the end of the table. And so feet were always washed when you entered a home because your feet were dirty and they were stinky and it was not pleasant to be around. Are you with me? I don't like feet. Anybody else with me? All right, thank you. Feet are just... Their feet. They're, we're thankful for them, but to look at them, to touch them, not really a fan. And so they all walk in, and over in the corner of the room is what? A basin, and a pitcher, and a towel. And I'm sure when they walked in, most of them noticed it, right? And I'm sure all of them probably thought, somebody needs to wash feet but not me. I'm sure James and John thought, no way. We're part of the inner circle. We're the sons of thunder. We don't wash feet. Peter's like, I'm obviously the most important. I'm the spokesman. I'm one of Jesus' favorites. I shouldn't wash feet. All of them thought that somebody should, but nobody did. Even James the less, right? 
I don't know if they called them the less back then. I hope they didn't. <laughs> you ever think about that? Hey, the less. Come here. What a terrible nickname. Boo. In the middle of that meal, he gets up and he goes over and he grabs the pitcher in the basin. He takes off his outer robe and he ties it around his waist and he begins to wash feet. Dirty, nasty, stinky feet. Feet that probably had really ugly calluses on them and corns and fungus. Are you with me? Are you, gr are you glad you already had breakfast? <laughs> Alright, feet are gross. And Jesus begins to wash. Think about some of the feet that he washed. He washed Philip's feet. Philip was the one who one day when Jesus said, hey, we need to feed these people, Philip said, uh, no can do. Not possible. This very night, after Jesus washes his feet, Jesus is going to answer Thomas' question. When Jesus says, I'm about to leave, right? And I'm going to my Father, but I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come again and where I go, you can come also. And Thomas says, well, hey, we don't know how to get there. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You remember that? I am the only way to the Father. And then he goes on and he says, if, if you have seen me, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then Philip says, can you show us the Father? And that'll be enough. What does Jesus do for people who question him? He washes their feet. Think about James and John, those sons of thunder, right? They were lobbying for top positions in the coming Jesus administration. They sort of sensed that Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to set up his kingdom, and we want to have big time positions in the kingdom. They were thinking vice president and secretary of state. Are you with me? They wanted to be the big dogs in the kingdom. And what does Jesus do for people who want to use his kingdom for personal advancement? He washes their feet. When Peter's turn comes up, look at verse 6. When Peter's turn comes up, he says, When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, why are you going to wash my feet? You know, Peter's just watching all this and he starts to realize this is just wrong. It is wrong for Jesus to be washing our feet. This is what the servant does. This is what the lowest servant in the household does. Why is Jesus? This is not right. And he says, Jesus, you're, you're not going to wash my feet. No way. Not my feet, Jesus. Jesus says, you don't understand now why I'm doing it, but someday you will. And Peter says, no. <laughs> no, Jesus. I'm not going to understand someday because you're not washing my feet. He says, you'll never wash my feet. Have you ever said you would never do something? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't usually work so well with God. So Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you won't belong to me. And then Peter says, well, give me a bath then. He's like, now that you put it that way, I would like a bath. <laughs> wash me, right? And Jesus says, Peter, Peter. You're all over the place, Peter. <laughs> if you're a person that's all over the place, just know that you're not alone. And he says, Peter, you're already clean. If you've had a bath, you only need to wash your feet. What's he saying? He says, you have believed in me, you have trusted me, your position is clean, but your feet get dirty, and you have to deal with dirty feet. It's a picture of how we have to deal with the sin in our life. We're clean in Christ, but we still sin, and we have to deal with that sin. But then Jesus says this, he says, you are clean, verse 10, but that isn't true of everyone here. It isn't true of everyone here. Of course, he's referring to Judas. It says in the text that he had already conspired. Satan had entered his heart and he had already contracted out to sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Judas is the faker, the pretender. His worst deed is already done. And Jesus is coming around the table with the basin of water and the towel. And what's he going to do when he gets to Judas? I, I don't know about you, but if, if I was Jesus, I think I would have sent him out right then. Judas, you're going right back out on the street to betray me, so I'm not going to bother washing your feet. Judas, go. But instead, Jesus 
washes his feet. The very one that betrayed him, he washed his feet. Think about that. It was almost like he was giving him one more chance, one more opportunity. He wasn't excusing his sin. He wasn't overlooking his sin. He was just loving him to the end and loving him to the full. What enabled Jesus to do that? I mean, yes, he was God, but in his humanity, what enabled Jesus to wash the feet of his betrayer? And the, the thing that we see is that as Jesus entrusted his hurt to the Father. Jesus entrusted his hurt to his Father. And if you and I are going to deal with the hurt in our life, the pain, and if we're going to deal with the ones who have hurt us, we have to do the same thing. Jesus entrusted his hurt to the Father. The Bible says that we are not to take vengeance for ourselves because vengeance belongs to God. And he will take care of it. Your father in heaven will take care of it. Was there ever a time growing up that you hit a situation that you didn't know how to handle, but you really thought my dad can handle this? All right, guys, did you ever have the conversation about how your dad could beat up your friend's dad? Right? Anybody? All right. Thank you, Davis. Jesus entrusted his hurt to the Father. Listen, it hurt Jesus deeply to be betrayed. Don't miss his humanity in all of this. Don't miss the fact that it hurt Jesus to be betrayed. In fact, if we look down in verse 21, and, I, and I'm going to read from a paraphrase, okay? It's called the message. It's okay. I know it's not a translation. It's just one guy putting the Bible into his own words, so don't stone me. But listen to what it says in the paraphrase of verse 20. It says, After these things, it says, Jesus became visibly upset. It said he was, literally in the text, it says he was troubled in his spirit. It says he became visibly upset. And then he told them why. He says, One of you is going to betray me. Jesus knows the pain of betrayal. He knows what it's like to experience hurt. Judas was someone who had spent three years with him in close fellowship. And he was going to sell Jesus out. And it hurt him. Jesus knew the pain of betrayal. He knew that Peter, who had just exclaimed, Jesus, give me a bath because I want to be so close to you and I want you in my life. He knew that same Peter that very night was going to deny that he even knew him. It hurt Jesus. Jesus knows what it's like to hurt. And he showed us how to deal with them. We deal with them according to grace. Look back in verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. You see, I really think in this verse we see the secret of how Jesus handled this hurt, how he entrusted his hurt to the Father, because he understood his authority and his identity. He understood his authority and his identity. Listen, he says he knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. He knew why he was here, and he knew who he was. He had come from God and would return to God. He knew his mission. And understanding who he was and why he was here enabled him to handle the hurts of life. Understanding your position in Christ as an object of his love and his affection and his grace. Understanding that you're in here not for yourself anymore. If you're in Christ, you're not here for you anymore. Right? As Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ lives in me. He says, in the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This life isn't your life anymore. And it's understanding that that helps you have a different perspective on the people that hurt you. It's understanding them through Jesus' eyes and through His grace and through the power that He gives to forgive. Jesus knew the who and why of life. And that's what enabled Him to handle the hurt and the betrayals with grace. It's what enabled Him to bend down and touch the dirty parts of His followers. And He calls you and I to follow His example. Because what happened that night was not just about getting stinky feet clean, was it? 
It was Jesus showing his disciples and ultimately showing us how we are to see others and how we're to live. Look at verse 12 there in John chapter 13. It says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe again. And he sat down and he asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You see, if it was just about washing feet, he wouldn't have had to say that, would he? But it wasn't just about washing feet. He says, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher, rabbi, and Lord. And you are right because it's true. You ought to wash each other's feet. For I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Jesus says, I have shown you what it looks like to love and serve others. And that's being willing to touch the dirtiest parts of their life, being willing to meet their lowest need, being willing to serve even the ones who have doubted you, being willing to serve the ones who have denied you, being willing to serve the ones who betray you. Because here's something I've come to know. There's something very powerful that happens in our heart when we're willing to serve the people that hurt us. When we're willing to show the grace and the compassion that Jesus has shown us, when we're willing to show that to others, and when we actually do that, when we don't just say in my mind, I forgive you, but we actually serve them, something very powerful happens in our lives. It sets us free from the bitterness and the pain that we're carrying in our heart. Jesus said this. He says, if you love only those who love you, what good is that? For even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're only kind to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Jesus says we're to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. And Jesus didn't just say it, he did it. And then he said this, Do as I have done to you. Do as I have done to you. What about your feet? Are they wet? And what I mean by that, has Jesus washed you? Have you experienced his free and grace that covers your sin? Have you experienced his forgiveness and his kindness and his mercy? Have you been bathed? Has Jesus washed your feet? And if he has, then you can forgive others. Because you've experienced his forgiveness and his grace. And what God has done for you, he will enable you to do for others. Here's the thing. Grace doesn't ignore the sin. It doesn't overlook the sin. It doesn't excuse the sin. It doesn't say that what was done to you was right. It doesn't mean that there won't be justice in their life. It doesn't mean that they won't be dealt with. It just means that you will entrust the hurt to the Father. And you'll say, my father who loves me with an incomprehensible love will deal with this situation. And I don't have to be the one that pays back. In fact, I don't have to be the one who carries around this hurt and this pain anymore. I can put this situation into the hand of my father who loves me and who gave his son for me. And who gave his son as an example to me. God will deal with it. God will deal with it, but he wants to free your heart. Because here's what happens. When you carry around the hurt and the pain and you don't forgive and you're unwilling to love and you're unwilling to follow what Jesus says to do, you're unwilling to share and show the same grace that he's given you, it causes bitterness to grow up in your heart. And the pain lodges there and it poisons your life. And God wants to set you free from that hurt. He wants to set you free from that pain. God gives us the power to forgive. Grace gives us the power to forgive. Jesus knew who he was. He knew why he was here. And you have to understand that. You just say, I know why I'm here. I'm here to bring glory to my Father in heaven. I'm here to serve his purposes. And then at the end, I enter his presence forever and ever and ever. And so that gives me a whole other perspective on my hurt and my pain. That the things that happen to me, I realize, are filtered through the hand of my Father and he will deal with that. Jesus knew who he was. He knew why he was here. And so I want to ask you, do you know the who and why of life? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know why you're here? 
And when you know who you are and why you're here, it will help you to be able to do what Jesus did. You're in Christ. You're set free. You're a child of God. You're his masterpiece. And as such, you can do what Jesus has asked you to do. And when we do, here's what happens. God starts to remove the hairs. Remember, if hurts were hairs, we'd be what? And when we choose to trust our Father, and we choose to follow the example of Jesus, He removes the hairs. He removes the pain and the hurt. Jesus said this, in John chapter 13, verse 17. He says, you know these things, now do them. That is the path of blessing. And so here comes the point of, uh, of tension for us. Are we going to trust God by faith and follow his example? Or are we going to think that we know better than God and think, no, getting revenge and getting back and paying back and holding on to my hurt and doing it my way is better. Or we're going to say, maybe, just maybe, my Father in heaven who loves me with this incredible love, he gave me his son, maybe I can trust him. Jesus knows your hurt. He is not a God who is unsympathetic. He is not a God who does not feel or care. He feels and he knows and he cares. Jesus knows what it's like to be hurt. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what that pain feels like. He is a compassionate high priest. And he wants you to come to him and trust him with that hurt. To let his healing touch your life. And part of that healing in touching your life is you choosing to do what Jesus did. Which is to forgive the one who's hurt you. And to be willing even to serve them. It sounds crazy. It sounds impossible. But because your feet are wet. Because Jesus has washed you. He will give you the power to do it. And it will set you free. Would you bow your heads this morning? I know that many of you. I saw your hands raised. I know many of you have come here with hurt in your life. There is pain in your life. And I know that I don't understand it completely and I don't know the situations and I don't know all that you've been through. But there is a God in heaven who does and he sees and he knows and he cares. And he doesn't want you to keep carrying around that pain and that hurt. He has a solution. Jesus demonstrated what it looks like to serve the very ones who betray us. The ones who doubt us. The ones who deny us. And he says, do as I have done for you. I, I want you to think about, maybe, maybe right now in your mind you're, you're thinking about that person that God has brought to your mind. That person that you've not been able to forgive. Maybe it's a friend that stabbed you in the back. Maybe it's somebody who, who, who did something to you that was, they, they stole something from you. They took something from you. They wronged you. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a family member. I don't know who it is. But I know today that God is wanting you to entrust your heart to his, his heart. And he's wanting you to forgive. And he's wanting you to even be willing to serve. And he wants to do that so that you, your heart can be free. He'll deal with them. You're not excusing it. You're not saying it's right. You're not saying it wasn't wrong or didn't hurt. You're just saying God is big enough to handle it. Father, I just pray for each person that's here this morning. Father, you know their heart. You know their hurt. You know their pain. And Father, I just pray that, that through your power and through your grace that we would learn to forgive the ones who have hurt us. And not just say that we forgive them, but be willing to even serve them if we have the opportunity. Father, trusting that although it doesn't make sense to our natural mind, that you know best. And that in doing that, we will be set free from the pain and the hurt that is plaguing our hearts and our lives. And Father, I just pray that, that even here while we're here, we'd be able to open up about these things and talk. Father, whether it's with our counselor or with a teacher or someone. Father, I just pray that, that you would bring freedom from the hurt and the pain that so many carry. And Father, I thank you that you personally gave your son for us, that he carried our hurts and our pains, that he died for our sins. Father, I thank you that because of that, we can trust you. 
Help us. We need your grace to do it. It's not the natural way that we tend to respond to hurt. Father, help us to come to that place where we respond to hurt supernaturally by your grace, trusting you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.